Over the last year, two major disruptions have prompted reckonings in the theater community. Many theaters had to pivot and go remote using Zoom and Skype to get performances to audiences. And arts organizations joined other institutions to ask big questions about diversifying the stories they tell and who tells them. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today, we're joined by three leaders of Connecticut's theater community. They join me for a roundtable discussion on how they survived this year and how they think the industry should evolve. Tanisha Dugan is artistic producer of TheaterWorks Hartford. Dexter Singleton is executive artistic director at Collective Consciousness Theater. It's a multicultural theater company based in New Haven, and they're dedicated to social change through the art of live theater. Christiana Smith is owner and co-founder of Via Arts. It's a liberation consulting practice that uses arts-infused programming to break systems of oppression and move closer to a structurally care-centered world. Tanisha, Dexter, Christiana, welcome to Disrupted. Thanks, great to be here. Thank you, thanks for having me. So much of what we've seen over this last year has been about contending with these dual disruptions of COVID-19, as well as the racial reckonings that have been happening across the country. And there's been a major impact on the arts, but in particular on the theater community. So let's start with the COVID-19 pandemic as the big disruption. Tanisha, how has COVID-19 had an impact on the theater community here in Connecticut? Um, I'll speak first from personal, and then hopefully that's universal. Dexter will speak to that, whether or not that's true. Um, I think uh, for theater works, which is where I work, um, it was an opportunity to uh, disrupt the way we work. Um, the way we come to work, the way we interface with other workers. Uh, and that is still a journey that we're on. Um, but I think COVID sort of opened the door for that. Um, in terms of like the work that we make, it, it sort of allowed for an innovation that I think was always a part of who we were, um, but allowed us to push um, the ways in which we were being innovative in a way that uh, we would have talked about wanting to do five years from now that all of a sudden we did five days later, right? Um, and then in terms of, of really being accessible and in, in like in the broadest way, um, we now, our programs I think are now accessible. I feel like, I feel comfortable in saying that. Um, I don't, I wouldn't have said that before. I would have tried to like couch it and frame it in a way to make it uh, feel more open, but I feel good about where we've come to. Still much more work to do, um, but in terms of people who maybe aren't theater people or people who may not have looked at theater works as something interesting to, to consume, I think can, both because closed captioning, right? And and ASL are like standard parts of our procedures, but also we're telling different stories. Um, and that is because of COVID, but also because of the ancestor George Floyd. And I want to come back to that piece of the community and the engagement in theater now. Dexter, there's always the question of who comes through the doors into a theater but also what is the experience that they have. So talk to us how theaters and in your space, what that adaptation looked like throughout this last year. Well, um, for collective consciousness, you know, we've always tried to be an organization that's been really inclusive uh, to the community. All people are welcome, families are welcome, uh, young people, you know, people of all different, you know, backgrounds are, are welcome to that CCT and we hope they feel, um, you know, at home. Uh, for us, um, you know, we're, we were always thinking about accessibility, but we knew like every um, theater producer that there were people you weren't reaching because they physically could not get to the theater uh, for some reason or another. And uh, to have programming online, you know, allowing somebody to meet them where they are and really meet them where they are right in the center of their home. Uh, has been very convenient. Um, a lot of people have tuned in that have watched theater and programming that never have in their lives before. 
um, because it's just as easy now as, as uh, you know, turning on anything, any app or Netflix or, or, or what have you. So that's really helped. The other piece though, unfortunately, what we've seen as well, um, we were just finishing up a, a virtual program that we did that started in person before the pandemic um, that was um, a multi-generational piece about women and girls and voting, right? And hearing stories from elders about how, you know, their voting journey started and then what that means for young people uh, today. But what we found with a lot of our elders is that um, they did not have internet access or they lived in spaces where if they lived in a senior living facility, um, that there was an extra fee per apartment to be able to access the internet, right? And that's in addition to whether you had cable or not or had internet um, service that you were paying this extra fee. So that became a barrier uh, that we found. So then we were having to switch gears and then do a lot of our communication uh, by phone uh, because we couldn't use the online you know, interview uh, format, right? Or having to go and be in person and be socially distant in a park or something of that nature. So there were ways that, you know, we saw it um, increase accessibility, but then also ways when a person doesn't have access to the internet, you know, then we still are faced with the same problem um, that we had pre-pandemic. We talk so much about access and, and connectivity and internet access in the realm of young people in schools, which we should. But Dexter, you've just spoken to the need to see this as a holistic challenge, really from childhood through elderly status of what it means to not have that connection and be able to seek and create community in different ways. Christiana, I am someone who cringes when people talk about arts organizations and their value simply as economic development engines, because I always think it's nice that they bring in revenue, but art isn't this commodity that we should just put a price tag on. And yet there is the reality that if people are not coming into the space, the space may not be able to stay open. How do you, as the owner and the co-founder of Via Arts, how do you navigate that tension between, yes, we need to be able to run and be viable as an organization, but still keep the heart of what we need to do to adapt and to thrive? Yeah. Um, first of all, I love this question. Uh, I think, you know, the organizations that asked me to come in and like consult with them are, are thinking about this, right? They're like, well, we have, we have a, we have a bottom line to meet and we also have a community to meet. And I, I don't think that these are separate things. I think that the reality is that wealth has been concentrated to the top, whatever percent. And, and the reality is like most nonprofits will die uh, if they don't figure out different mechanisms to earn money. And that it might not be like, we need to get millions of dollars from this one person. It might be like, we need to figure out a way to be accessible so that millions of people are coming into our space or that thousands or hundreds of people are coming into our space. And so I don't think that these are necessarily separate questions. I think there's a reality that the financial stability of an organization can be tied to like the actual amount of people, even if those people are only able to bring five, 10, $15, that like, if you have masses bringing you $15 and you're actually speaking to a mass of a community that your, phys your physical space is in, you will also be sustainable. And the reason that so many organizations find themselves in unsustainable places is that not to be morbid, but the people who give them money pass away and are no longer giving them money. So, and, and they don't have a livelihood in their, in their physical community. So I actually don't think that the economic reality and the community reality are separate things. I think that that is a, a, a mechanism of white supremacy that says wealthy people are how we stay alive rather than saying the community is how we stay alive. And black communities have been creating and, and innovating and surviving and thriving throughout all of the white supremacy of America. And, um, and if, and if only the, you know, larger theaters could, or lar not just theaters, but larger organizations could tap into that, I think that they would find a wealth of, of income. Uh, so that, that would be my two cents around that. That's more than two cents. That, that's a full dollar there, Christiana. You know, one of the things that as I was listening to you, I was remembering that there was this controversy back in February with, I believe it was an executive director of a museum in Indiana 
who put out this job description saying, we want someone who can still attract traditional white audiences. That's not implicit bias. It's not subtle. It's not a microaggression. It is very clearly stated that we want someone who will not forget how we got here. And as you were talking about what happens when donors and supporters pass away, what then do you do? All three of you are working in a space that has not always been welcoming to creatives who look like you or who want to tell the stories that you are telling. So I want to go to all three of you, but Tanisha, I'll start with you. What does that, how does that show up? in terms of thinking about that adherence to the traditional audience, the opportunities to tell new stories or different stories, and the realities of this pandemic that limit some of the things that you can do in the theater space? Well, I'll start with the last piece, which is that I actually don't think there are limits to what we can do because of the this, this circumstance. And that's a jetpack off of what Christy just said, which is, you know, Black people have figured out how to thrive and survive within circumstances that don't uh, don't immediately go, this seed can grow, but that, you know, tree in Brooklyn is a real thing, right? And so I, I live from that place. Uh, the, the sort of answer to the other two parts is that one, I think I'm a masochist and I think that's probably a part of my blackness which is just like well this is the world I live in so I'm going to step into this very white world um and it has been a question that me that I have been personally been asking myself like what is it you know I am I grew up firmly middle class I am a firmly middle class by circumstance and and I, I mean that by the love and kindness and support of the collective that I live with um but I've been struggling with like theater, American theater, and and it's centering whiteness, both in the projects that are produced, but in the way that we work, um, the folks I'm mostly surrounded by. Uh, I am not as brave as Dexter and Christiana, um, so I don't have my own shingle, um, but there, there are times when I go, ooh, what about that? Or at least what about working at one of the preeminent Black theaters, right, as a, as a way to sort of um, move because I think I think the theaters that I am interfacing with both my own and, and others have a really hard time divesting themselves from the donor relationship and divesting themselves from uh, the audience that they've cultivated um, one of the biggest you know conversations I've been having lately around the donor relationship is like you seem to think there are not rich black people <laughs> right like there are rich black people who are capable of of uh of giving at the level of of some of our other donors the, the problem is you don't speak to them right and so it and so wealth comes in a wealth of colors and the question is what is your mission that allows those people to come in and want to give some of that wealth away and i haven't seen a real interest um within development and board cultivation of really wanting to go there because I think when you really go there then you really aren't just playing around the edges of your mission you are really embedding that conversation in a place in which it's meant to be which is at the top or at at the decision making level of the organization. Dexter what about you how do you center those kinds of of concerns or opportunities that Tanisha just talked about and still navigate the multiple, often competing realities that you face? Well, one of the things we've been fortunate with uh, at Collective Consciousness is it was born out of the idea of a bunch of artists who were working artists, but weren't happy with uh, many of the conditions with what they were working in. And so many of us have started out working in the regional theaters and as actors, directors, you know, what have you, other creatives, and uh, we were going and we were seeing a set of circumstances as artists of color or artists who are socially conscious. And we're like, wait a minute, we're not getting an opportunity to really interact with the audience at all. It's just, you know, come to the venue, do the show and, and then leave. And we wonder about how the show is affecting people. Uh, we wonder about the playwright who wrote this play and had some social 
um, ideas in mind that are these social issues being relayed uh, to the audience and to the community? Why are there so many people that look like me that aren't in this space? I did a show many years ago as an actor in regional theater and an actor came to me right during the show and they said to me, uh, when you go out there, look at the audience and everybody is white and wearing glasses. And I remember walking out on the stage, you know, at a theater, which made me feel like, oh, I've made it. And I look out and in, in a show with an entire black cast, looking out into the audience and seeing all white faces with glasses and gray hair. And it made me say, I've got to do something different. I've got to, you know, disrupt a little bit. And, you know, we create it as a collective, you know, collective consciousness. But I think in those larger spaces, it really starts with not just saying we want artists of color on our stages because we know that impact is very little for the artists and for the community, but we have to say, okay, how can we have a diverse staff? Uh, what are the values and anti-racist values that are at the top of the organization to fight against systemic racism, to fight against white supremacy um, and racism? And then, um, right, like we've already talked about a little bit is the restructuring of a board. And, and not just looking at a value, we know, right, donor power and dollars mean a lot, but also um, boards not just being constructed on who can give the most. Um, and in theater, we've done that a lot. You know, a lot of boards are pay to play and um, based on what someone can give, but people have a lot more value that, that, that is equal to money, right? For, you know, for those who need it to equal money, right? So it's always need to equal money, but definitely people's reach in the community, skill sets, all of those things are uh, a lot of times worth more than physical, than dollars, right? And so we've got to look at how we put those boards together to be more inclusive, more part of the community, because these are nonprofit organizations ultimately that are drawing state, city, municipal dollars, and they need to represent the community better. That was Dexter Singleton, Executive Artistic Director at Collective Consciousness. Coming up, we'll continue our conversation about theater in Connecticut with Dexter, Tanisha Dugan from Theater Works Hartford, and Christiana Smith from Via Arts. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're talking with members of Connecticut's theater community about how they move forward during a pandemic and a racial reckoning. These two disruptions have forced people in theater to rethink what theater can be. Tanisha Dugan is artistic producer of Theater Works Hartford. Dexter Singleton is executive artistic director at Collective Consciousness Theater. And Christiana Smith is owner and co-founder of Via Arts. I asked Christiana about the tension between predominantly white institutions and those founded and created by members of the black community. It's something I see as an academic in conversations about historically black colleges, but I also know that question plays out in creative spaces. Yeah. Um, just because this is on my mind and I don't think, so Dexter and I have never, I don't think he's mem remembers meeting me ever, but he came to my high school. That's like, age you, but you came to my high school. And I just like, remember being like, yeah, like that guy, like what he does. And I just, and I'm saying that because I think that is a moment and like my being here, like someone on my path was, was just like, here is an opportunity child living in a predominantly white space for you to see theater, this thing that you love in a different way. Right. Um, and it was one of the many things that happened in my life that made me go, Oh, there are places that I can do this that aren't the traditional places that you say I can do this. Right. Um, and so in one of the things that I studied in college was uh, theater, of the oppressed, right. Which is, which began Augusta Boal began in Brazil as like a revolutionary, like theater as an act of protest. Um, and I, and I, as a person was like, okay, how do I turn this thing that seems really cool into activation? Like into like, how do, how does this look? So not just like theater on stage, not just theater in community. Um, how does this look like theater in process? And I think that one of the things that we forget is that we actually have the capacity to like change things up always. Um, and I think nothing has taught people that more than COVID. The, like back to the point that Tanisha made, like people were like, oh, like in five years, we'll think about maybe talking about possibly doing that somehow. Um, 
And now we're in COVID and suddenly like in 30 days, everyone was able to change their things. So what that tells me is that actually we all have the capacity to if we truly wanted to live in these values, regardless of what our, our foundational structure was, we all have the capacity to shift that when we're ready to do that. And so one of the things that I consult around is specifically what are your behaviors and practices? What are the things that you do and how are those things revealing the values of your organization? Um, and so when it comes to like, well, we were built like this, so this is the only thing we can do. I'm like, if that was true, every theater would currently be closed right? And they're not. So it's not, it, it's going to look different. Every, um, I like to tell people like white supremacy wants us to look like machines, but humans are really more like plants and the things that we do are more like plants. And I talk about this one time that my tomato plant fell down and it was only down for like a day, but it had already started growing roots. Cause it was like, if I'm going to be on the ground, I'm still going to grow. So I think that like every organization and every space can say, okay, here's where we're at. We want to be more like something else from where we're at. How do we start moving that way? Um, and it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be built on anti-racism to start dismantling white supremacy within your organization. Um, you don't have to be built on, like those don't have to be your core values to start with, but you can always shift to something different. And, and so it's like analyzing, like what are the things within our capacity that we can start doing small ways that we can start just like, treating each other, like inviting people like into this space. And one of the things that I think I hear a lot, which is like money, money, money. And it's like, instead of thinking about theater as a product that is being produced for donors, thinking about theater as a thing that is being produced for the community and like really by and for the community, it, it fundamentally shifts. You know what I mean? Like it becomes like a CSA, not to give like another gardening metaphor, but it becomes less about like, it becomes less about like product payment and more about like, we are collectively bringing this thing. So I, as a donor bring, I donate my community. I donate, like I am bringing my community to the space. I am bringing my wealth to the space. I am bringing my creativity to the space. And that's actually how we're inventing this craft together versus like, I have a friend that I think is very good at the creative things and I will be paying the money to produce creative things that I want to watch. That's like, it's really fundamentally shifting that relationship. And what our, you know, li our listeners can't see that Christiana has these beautiful plants that are blooming behind her. So the juxtaposition of these gorgeous plants with what she's saying is perfect. Go ahead, Tanisha. No, I, you know, you were, you talked about uh, HBCUs and PWIs, and that is also one of those things that I continually uh, circle around in terms of like spaces and how we value them. Both of my parents are Howard grads. When my parents took me down to Howard to visit, I saw this inner city that was, that is DC. And I was like, how could you bring me down here and think this is where I'm going to go to school? And I now sit and I think to myself, all I ever wanted, all I should have gotten was more blackness, you know? Space with more black people because I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up surrounded by whiteness. What I needed was an opportunity to see my people, not just my parents, not just people that my parents brought to my experience, but like, just regular old black people coming to a place to say, I love science, I love art, I love math, I love sports, I love all of the things, and I am here for, you know, to, to be better and also blacker in doing these things. So I think there's a value proposition we make around white spaces that we are guilty of, that black and brown people are guilty of, um, that I was guilty of when I was looking at where to go to college, that I think we're in the midst of investigating because I actually think it is uh, what was once called the talented 10th, right? It's, it, is, it is actually our responsibility to, to divest from whiteness if we're actually going to ask whiteness to see us as equal in value. Dexter, so much of the Black artistic tradition is syncretic, that it brings from these different parts of our experience. It, it reaches across the diaspora and it affirms the fullness of these communities so that there is not a singular voice or a singular story, but it really uplifts that fullness in a way that I think the, the broader world and definitely the broader theater space does not always affirm. 
And here we are now almost a year to the day of the start of uprisings across the country to really reject that singular story of Black experiences. I also want to say that I think it's amazing that you were able to to be this perspective for Christiana, but it also means that there's sort of this, this weight of I know we don't get a lot of opportunities to tell these stories, so I need to be able to do that. Thinking about where we are a year since those uprisings and then the need to tell the fullness of those stories, what is the possibility that theater has to continue telling those stories and not allowing us to forget? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank thank you, Christiana. Um, and I didn't forget, I remember that you, you know, wrote me an email like all those years ago, um, after you had seen the show. Um, and, you know, there are ones over the years that kind of stick out to me, but I do remember you as a, you know, kid saying, oh, I want to do this type of theater and, and thank you for, for, you know, the show. And, you know, and that's the intent, right, of, of collective consciousness. And I really appreciate that means a lot, um, you know, in that early show of Little Brother, that was based on an experience that I had experiences that I had growing up in Detroit and friends and my community that I've been around, you know, being from a chocolate city like Detroit and seeing just the, you know, the wide range, right? The, the richest uh, of black people, the poorest of black people across all different, you know, some of the greatest artists in the world, right? And people across other fields as, as well, um, you know, as, as black people, right, we have always endured, we've always been able to pivot, we've always been able to shift. And we've seen, you know, in the last year, uh, what's happened is uh, there's been a lot of movements in the theater um, that have taken place and uh, artists coming together and, and holding these major, you know, PWIs, um, you know, uh, to some of their values and what they, um, are saying that they're going to do in the community and how are they going to change and how are they going to do more and be more inclusive and more diverse. Um, we're seeing some organizations that are moving toward that, but still a lot that are offering lip service. And it's difficult. It's difficult as an artist of color. Where do you go? You know, there's, you know, we still often, um, you know, what years ago we used to call on the seeds, and I'm sure there's some form of this now um, is what we used to call the black slot. You know, every theater, every PWI does the one show and we always joke as artists, right? You know, back in the day of, uh, you know, well, we're trying to get the black slot, you know, on their season. And uh, and we're still unfortunately seeing that. We're still seeing a lot of ADs who are saying that, um, you know, shows of people of color don't sell or they don't do this or they don't do that. And we know um, we've seen, you know, tons, countless number of stories as part of the black community that, outsell, you know, any project, you know, uh, that's around. And so um, I think we've got to still look toward uh, building our own organizations, uh, building those up more um, so that we have uh, more value. One of the things that's really helped me as an artist is having CCT and being able to produce and having those partnerships across the globe, um, you know, over the course of these years that we've been around um, that, I don't, I have the power where I don't have to work for certain PWIs, right? Because if they try to, you know, pay me less or offer me this or have the project cost this money, I can always say to them, now I can create a project that will do better than those numbers that you're offering me now, right? Or the budget that you're offering me now or the, you know, whatever the structure of the project, I can do a better job of that within my own organization. So why should I work for you when I know that my project's gonna reach the community uh, even more so. So for me, what I've started to do is come into organizations and say, I'm gonna bring the values of collective consciousness into this project. This project has to reach out to the community. It has to um, give uh, artists, has to be a mix of artists that are uh, equity union artists, as well as non-equity that are from the community that are getting their first breaks. It has to have a mix of young people who are part of the crew and BIPOC designers, right? It has, so, so a list of things that these projects have to have, or I'm not gonna work at that, at that organization. And so as artists, we've got to start looking at our value, right? And, and investing in ourselves and, and really saying that, you know, we're not going to work for an organization 
if they're not going to make an attempt to dismantle um, uh, you know, systemic racism and white supremacist ideas. Coming up, we continue our conversation with Dexter Singleton of Collective Consciousness, Tanisha Dugan from TheaterWorks Hartford, and Christiana Smith from Via Arts. How does Connecticut's theater world move forward? This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're talking with members of Connecticut's theater community about how they're adapting amid major disruptions. Tanisha Dugan is artistic producer at TheaterWorks Hartford. Dexter Singleton is executive artistic director of Collective Consciousness Theater. And Christiana Smith is owner and co-founder of Via Arts. So the question I'll I'll raise to all three of you and, and jump in as you will. You know, last year we saw a lot of organizations, a lot of institutions virtue signaling that it was an easy choice to put up a sign or to put out a statement and to condemn the actions of others. What we have not seen as much and to the same level are those forces being willing to look introspectively and determine how do they sustain that work once it is no longer popular to say you stand with the movement for Black lives? How do you continue that? So I'll say that to ask to all three of you, in the context of the theater community, what needs to be done to not just say you stand in solidarity, but to actually live, breathe, and act in solidarity? Um, I'm going to jump in. So I work outside the theater community. Like I work outside organizations. I just like to like contextualize my, my perspective. Um, But in general, like we are in a house on fire, right? Like white supremacy is killing all of us. If literally, um, and, and, and we need to get out of the house. And so there's like multiple places we can be, right? So we could be the people who are building the house we're all going to move to. We could be the people who are building scaffolding to get us from the burning building into that house, but we have to pick a stance of where we're going to be. And what I see is like, you're talking about like self-reflection. Um, like you, you just said that. And it's like, I see a lot of people who are willing to stand in the burning house and say, this house happens to be on fire. This is, it is very hot in this burning house that we are all sitting in. Um, we should probably do something like, let me get a bucket of water and throw it, that will fix this house. Um, And I see people who are unwilling to grieve, right? So I talk about grieving a lot. I'm like, grieve, grieve that this place might've harmed someone, grieve that this place is harming people right now, grieve that there are things that have happened in this house that you will love till the end of time that are beautiful, that have been powerful, and that all of those things can happen at the same time. They could have, it could be harmful and beautiful and, terrible and whatever. But the point is, is, is this house no longer is sustainable and we need to move. And so the first thing that I think is that places that really want to get with it need to be willing to leave people behind. So I hear people going like, oh, we got to meet people where they're at. Meet people where they're at to me means we send up a flare. So you know, the way to get where we're going, right? We send up, a, so you understand like this, we're, we're on the scaffolding, we're going towards that building that so-and-so is making over there. Like, and we're gonna make sure you know the way to get here. But don't stand in the building with the person who's just not ready to let it go and go down with the ship, go down with that building, right? Um, and I don't see a lot of organizations ready to do that. And back to my very first point, which is like, it will not be financially sustainable for you to stand in the building. So if you're here because of capitalism, the building's still going to burn down. If you're here, like ultimately you're going to have to realize that your connection to whiteness and to the things that you're not ready to grieve is really why this thing will no longer exist. But the only way forward in my heart of hearts is by creating new things. And so what they need to do is people need to be really ready to say, we are, we are going. And if you do not want to go with us, then we love and respect and we are so happy that you have given what you have given. We are so happy you have been on this journey with us and we hope that you find something that makes you happy, but it won't be here. And until places are ready to do that, they're going to, they're going to go down with the building. They will also burn. And like, that's just a hundred percent. Like I have no, I have, I don't think there's a maybe, I don't think it's a, 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 I think it's a when, not an if. 
Mm. That, all of that, all the time. And I believe theater is, you know, I hate that metaphor of theater as a mirror or, or theater, theater as a reflective of what's happening in the world. But I absolutely believe that, that the way the institution uh, responds as it relates to, to Christiana's metaphor is, is absolutely a reflection of our country, right? Like the, the thing is going down. And I love Christiana, you know, this, I, what you say about grieving and also the things that this house brought us, right? Because really like I am of a, um, of a people who built the house and like, cool. It's nice that the house existed, but like, I was never really meant to live inside of it. So like, I'm down for it to burn. Right. But I also respect the people who I built the house for, who lived in it, who made memories, who built wealth, who made families, whose entire existence is tied to this house that I built. Right. And I am coming to understanding that grieving process you talk about in which I'm like, yes, I, I have to give space for white people to grieve this thing that they have lived in for so long that has supported the lives that they are living today and that they are not sure. Like they they don't know who's building that house over there. And there is a lot of fear that the folks who are building that house over there are the ones who built the house today, but now want to live inside of it too, right? And I get like, yes, I get the, the grief and the fear and, and the nostalgia and also if there's anything you've learned about the community of people around this house is that they, ha they haven't really thieved it in all of the years. They haven't really come in and murdered it and taken it all down. They haven't dismantled or disrupted the house. They let you set it on fire and are now making the move someplace else. And I think that metaphor for theater and for this world, and if we can be a map if the theater community can be a map for how to do this with love and compassion um, and also the strength and the um, bravery to say, yes, yeah, some of y'all are gonna be left behind and some of y'all will be left behind and are the pillars of our industry, right? Like some of you have made theater, American theater what it is today and we will stand on your shoulders, but we will also walk <laughs> past you when what you've had to give no longer serves us. Um, and that is a that is not easy for a theater company, for a theater industry, for a country or for a world. Um, but I am hopeful um, that the seeds of the dandelion spread and they go, right? They, they you can't stop them. Um, and I hope most of us <laughs> come along. <laughs> Well, I, I agree with everything that's been said. You know, theater holds on to a lot of tradition um, and tradition to a fault. Um, you know, we, you know, we can honor the past, right? And look at where we've been, but we can't let that stop us um, from moving into the future. And a lot of times, right, our profit margins can be so slim at some theaters where you have theaters that are, you know, as nonprofits that are producing successful work, but still, you know, um, still, you know, still having to make moves to make payroll or to be able to produce uh, the next show, right? So they're really dependent upon that donor dollar. You know, it goes back to what I was saying a bit ago about, um, you know, a lot of theater companies just saying we can't produce work by BIPOC artists because it, because it doesn't sell. But then when you ask the, these theaters what they've done to uh, get out into the BIPOC community, what they've done to uh, reach out to new, um, you know, new patrons or, or new um, theater goers, uh, they don't say much, right? They haven't done much. Um, or they market the one show that's the BIPOC show to them and, you know, say, oh, we'll give away a bunch of free tickets, right? They love saying that. And then, uh, and then they'll get people in the door without, you know, while forgetting our value that we can pay for a ticket. We can pay for a ticket. I mean, come on, right? We can do that, right? We can be there and we can be right alongside anyone else. And so outreach is a big part of it moving forward um, and valuing BIPOC dollars, um, that we're in the room, that, you know, um, that we have just as much value as any other um, patron, 
Um, and, and I think staff is a big part of it. We have to really uh, get leadership in place um, because uh, without leadership thinking differently and inviting new people into your spaces, um, it's just gonna stay the same. Um, and I really fear that, you know, um, like we've been saying that, you know, there's too many people that don't know about the theaters. You can go a block in any direction and say, hey, have you heard of this spot? And they go, what? Where is that? They haven't. And so we can do a lot more. Um, and it's the fear of the unknown that really is stopping us, that we've done it so the same way for so long, so many of these theaters that they're just afraid to do anything else. And any change takes time but change um if it um moves us into the future in a better way in a more inclusive way it's change that's worth it could i could i just jump in with one more thing which is um like yes and i think what i find so interesting is that like change work is artist work right like artists understand that in a rehearsal you're gonna fail like a hundred times. Like the scene is not going to work the way you want it to work. You're going to have to keep figuring it out, but you'll see institutions who are moving from a survival place, not a creativity place. Right. So a survival place is like, we tried that thing for one time and it didn't work. So we're not going to do it. But that's like actually antithetical to what artistry is. Artistry is the process of failing and learning and trying again. And so um, like we need our art institutions to adopt artist mindsets. We need all of our institutions to adopt artist mindsets, but we need the art institutions to be able to be like, we're run by artists and artists mess up and keep going. Um, and so we, we don't want to see like one season that you tried something different and then it didn't work. It's like, do 50 seasons. Like do, that's how you got here in the first place. You got here in the first place because you tried something and it didn't work and you kept trying until it worked. Do that same thing moving forward um, because that change work, like I think it's interesting when we talk about artists being afraid of change, like that's our job. Like that's the artist's job is to be a, a space of change and like understand what creativity looks like in action. And learn that, you know, and take in the fact that change happened quickly. So you don't have to buy into change taking a long time, right? It can, ha it can happen immediately um, if the circumstances are right. And a lovely human offered to me uh, the idea, you know, we're so metrics driven, right? Don't look at metrics, give yourself the space to fail, fail and try for a year before you actually take a look and go, okay, so what did we make, right? Because because the, the anxiety and paranoia and neurosis of did this thing work, did this thing work, did this thing work, did somebody else tell me this thing worked is antithetical to artistry. Because what we go is we're together in the room. Did that feel right? No, I didn't feel right. All right, <laughs> let's try that again. Um, it, it's not something that's bestowed upon us by outsiders, not in the process. Yeah, I think theaters are going to have to really move toward being more like community centers. Um, you know, everybody's welcomed and there's, you know, the foot traffic that happens with a community center, right? You have everything from a person going there to partake in a particular activity or, you know, meeting or what have you, people who go to have lunch, people who go to meet a friend, people who go in, look around for a few minutes and leave, <laughs> right? Folk, you know, and that's okay, right? But feeling that comfort that you can walk in, walk around, look at some, you know, photos on the wall and then turn around and walk out or have your coffee there, right? And that comfortability. Theaters don't have that level of comfortability where you feel like you can walk in there, hang out for a few minutes and, and do what you like, right? And, and, and have that access, right? Why are the doors to the theaters always closed and locked? <laughs> and locked you can't even right even when you're on staff you have to be like hey can somebody give me a key to open the theater i just gotta <laughs> right staff can't even get in there sometimes right and so you know people need to be able to see the spaces how the theater doors are always locked how you expect people to come in there and want to sit down and see a show and thinking about right now where experimental theater happens it, like specifically thinking about like new haven it's like happening in the back of a lot of studio right like it's happening in it's happening in places where people could walk around during the day and they do another thing. And then, oh yeah, if you come back tonight, you'll see this thing at the back of the space. Like that is where really innovative, cr creative new stuff is happening is in spaces that are exactly what you described. And that is like, that is total pandemic uh, innovation, right? Because 
I, I can't announce, 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 but like we are in the process of doing something very similar, right? And we would not be thinking about this kind of, of way of producing if it weren't for social distancing and COVID, right? Like, and so it's like, well, we can't stop ourselves from creating. How can we? And the way we can is in public spaces where people are all around and about. Um, and I think that's gonna be transformative once we as an industry begin to feel, not just those of us who've always been doing outdoor theater or always been you know, in pop-up locations, but for the institutions who have never done it before, who are now like, oh, people are watching this work. People who institutionally we would say, oh no, the, you know, the, the show is not, the show is running right now, you can't come inside. The box office is closed, right? Now, people will be able to uh, approach um, at any time there's activity. And I think that is going to change mindsets about who from an institutional level is allowed to be uh, uh, confronted with our work, so to speak. Tanisha Dugan is artistic producer of Theater Works Hartford. Dexter Singleton is the executive artistic director at Collective Consciousness Theater. And Christiana Smith is the owner and co-founder of Via Arts. Thank you all so much for being powerful disruptors and for creating a new perspective for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. You. Disrupted is produced by Katie Tularski and Anna Elizabeth. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. We'll be back next week.